The White Witch Podcast with me, Carly. Hope you are all well, witches. On today's episode, we have our book review all about the holy world written by Danielle Dolsky. And we will also be talking all about Norse witchcraft. Before we get started, I just want to give a huge shout out to the following Patreon members. Feel like a Gary MC on the ones and twos. Never do that again, Carly. Barbara Cantley, Dominique McMillan. I now feel like I'm doing a meat raffle at the pub. <laughs> Barbara Cantley, Dominique McMillan, Samantha, Mandy, Carrie Norris, Jade Porter, Helen Highwater, Bethany Brown, Beth Lasky, Nishita, Emma Lily Thomas, Sean Flood, Samantha Randall, Elise Badai, Rachel Coates, Shanae Morris, Gemma, Tracy with two eyes, The Wonky Witch, Dillis, Hannah, Carrie Taylor, Twisted Pixie, Kelly, Anna Weaver, Sarah Ralston, Jade. Woo! I am so grateful for all of you for signing up and for being with me in the White Witch Coven. I'm loving the chats over on Discord. We've been talking altars, our last full moon, house witch tips, sharing witchy house aesthetics, discussing our witchy days out, also impending fall, autumn. I am so in love with the community we've got going on and I'm so grateful to you for supporting the show, being part of something I've longed to do for so long. I've got so many exciting things coming your way. So please come over and join me over on Patreon, not just me, all of the lovely witches that are also there too. There is a link in the show notes. It's only £6 a month, which in old money is 120 shillings. So when you put it like that, not being funny, it's probably not much more money nowadays than a portion of fish and chips. What that's got to do with anything, I don't know. Anyway, I digress. So for that six quid, give you a bit of the old Cockney rhyming slang. So six knicker or six lost and found pound, you get grimoire sheets for all of season two of the podcast and for some of season one tons of extra content and exclusive Patreon podcast episode every month and also access to the sweet witchy community I mentioned to you. So in the words of Del Boy, you know it makes sense. Come over all Cockney today. I don't know what that's about. Not been listening to Chaz and Dave or anything like that, but let's get serious. I've drunk too much coffee today and I'm really happy. So bear with me. Let's talk all about today's book. So grab a cup of Rosie Lee, drum roll please. This is a good one. Bloody epic. So today's book, I'm changing its title to The Witch's Bible. It is the one I've been searching for and me and a friend actually have been reading this together almost like a little mini study group and we are in love and I we really think you will be too. So You might remember me raving about Danielle Dolsky in previous episodes over the book, The Season of Moon and Flame. I'm sorry, but this book blows that one out of the water for me. I loved this. I know I say that I get really passionate about books, but this was just, I worked through this properly. Well, as much as I could in the time I had to read it, but it has been immense. I've realized so much I even just delivered an episode on Patreon that was heavily influenced by what I learned from this book and it has been a complete game changer. So on the Patreon, we talked all about holy days, which is what Danielle delves into, creating a day each week within your practice where you might just spend an hour, you might gift yourself an entire day where you work on your craft. She talks all about planning this perhaps around the spell days of the week, dependent on what you're working on, and it's begun to change my entire craft. 
I loved the way she breaks the book down into sections. So we have the book of earth, water, fire, and I've written earth down and I, <laughs> and I actually mean air. And each section is broken down into verses and rituals. So you have earth verses and earth rituals and the same for each element. Each section has a story that starts off the section. So the earth section is all about Lilith and her outgrowing the garden where she starts out. I love the initiations and incantations. I'm going to read you her bedtime incantations, a ritual prayer for the pilgrim priestess. On your loneliest nights, love, whisper these wild blessings straight into the shadowy haunted places of your psyche. Those warm, wet forests where the truest fairy tales are told and the loam skinned breasts of the ancient feminine rise and fall with breath under your bare feet. I'm wandering through these unmarked territories and learning new skills for surviving this particular wilderness I find myself in. This is the prayer of the last pilgrim priestess, and I will whisper these words into the unforgiving chill watching them fog out in all directions and willing them to bring comfort to every lonesome soul who finds themselves choosing stark liberation over a soft and sweet smelling nest. May I always grant myself permission to change and may I see others as cyclical beings in their own right. I am the new moon maiden, the full moon mother and the dark moon crone puffing in and out of existence. I am the most ancient mother tongue language spoken by my ancestors, and I'm just now remembering the words that are tattooed on my bones. I'm seeking out a new wild home, and I'm pouring its foundation on all I know to be true. When my hands are warm bloody with the work of it all, I will sleep safe in the knowing that my inner altar can never be crushed. Blessed be this tougher skin of mine and blessed be the holy world. I love that. I have to say, if you're going through a dark night of the soul experience or shadow work or even contemplating getting into it during the dark months ahead of us here in the Northern Hemisphere, this book is truly transformational. The journal prompts she gives are out there, amazingly creative. She has you envisaging yourself in all kinds of scenarios. This book is also deeply reassuring. I read this, I felt seen, I felt like the message was truly nourishing for my soul. I loved Season of Moon and Flames, her more recent book, but I felt this was more practical and easier to read. Season of Moon and Flames is very creative, poetic, mystical, imaginative. This is too, yet I felt it was more solid as a book to work through. Perhaps that's because I'm not as creative as I like to think I am, but this book definitely felt of more value to me personally. There are so many rituals, prayers, lessons in this book. This honestly could see you through an entire autumn and winter. I read through it. I worked on some of the journal points, but I'm going back again this autumn and winter through the book like a Bible study, even as a book for perhaps your bibliography. It truly is a Bible to me and one that I'll be keeping on my new altar that I am setting up that has also been inspired by this book. I think what I love the most about this book is the shift it has created within me to completely make my own practice entirely sacred to me and have me showing up more. I had a practice made up of a lot of cut and paste rituals, be they sort of spells, be they, be it spells, daily practices that I've meshed together from all different influences. And there's nothing wrong in that whatsoever. They all inspired me. But this book had me redesigning my practice, making them original to myself. This has encouraged me to start a new grimoire, set myself a weekly holy day, start up a new altar, set plans for the dark seasons. If you're someone who's very logical, 
doesn't like to beat around the bush when it comes to rituals and spell work and so on outlined in books. I don't think this would be for you. No disrespect, just being realistic as Danielle writes in a very romantic, poetical fashion. Everything is highly descriptive, imaginative. So I appreciate that's not everyone's cup of tea, but it is mine. I hope you love this book as much as me. Join me after the break when we talk all about Norse witchcraft. Welcome back. So I have had a chamomile tea and calmed myself down. I think I was close to hyperventilating in the first segment. I'm not quite sure what that was about. So recently we talked about Odin and I said I would love to come back to look further into different aspects of the Norse and how it links to witchcraft. Two things I heard recently made me curious about the Vikings and bloodlines in the UK. Firstly, I heard that as a Brit, you are more likely to have Viking blood than Celt and also that almost one million Brits alive today are of Viking descent, which means one in 33 men can claim to be a direct descendant of the Vikings. Around 930,000 descendants of warrior race exist today, despite the Norse warriors' British rule ending more than 900 years ago. A genetic study carried out by Britain's DNA compared the Y chromosome markers DNA inherited from father to son, of more than 3,500 men to six DNA patterns that are rarely found outside of Scandinavia and are associated with the Norse Vikings. Vikings, of course, left behind buildings, culture and words that are still used in the English language today. Key findings from the research include that men from the Shetland Isles made up 29.2% and Orkney Isles, made up 25.2%, heavily populated by the Northmen in the Viking Age, are most likely to have Viking in their bloodlines. South of Scotland, Yorkshire, which had 5.6%, and Northern England, which had 4%, are the most prominent areas of the country for Norse Viking ancestry, with more than 300,000 Northern men able to claim direct descent, accounting for almost a third of descendants. Further south, the percentage of Viking descendants drops significantly, with southwest England home to as few as 40,000 father line descendants. Despite being a known hotspot for the Vikings when they first landed, Ireland has very little sign of a Norse genetic contribution today, with only 1.4% of men from the Emerald Isle thought to have Viking connections. Leinster has a lower count of Viking bloodlines than any other part of Britain or Ireland. So Dr. Jim Wilson, chief scientist at Britain's DNA has said, despite arriving well over 1000 years ago, the Viking legacy still remains strong in Britain and Ireland. The research suggests that the concentration of Norse blood is quite variable. But as the Y chromosome only relates to the nation's male population and only to one ancestral lineage for each man, there is a very real chance that many more of us are related to the Vikings. So it's me talking now, not Dr. Jim Wilson. So to be honest, a lot, and I'm not ashamed to say it, a lot of this interest that I have started with my fascination with the programme Vikings, and I'm not ashamed to say it, but I recognise how many references there are to the Sabbaths, different rituals, the gods, the goddesses, of course, things that are also thrown into the English language and so on. So here we are. I would like to think as a result of my Scottish ancestry, my five foot 11 stature, I could be the descendant of someone ancestrally who could burn your village down. Lol. I'm sure they were very good people too. So... We're going to start today talking about the three norms. We talked about the three norms on our Odin episode, which I have now discovered I pronounced completely incorrectly on that episode. It won't be the first time. As I said, norms, and it's actually norms. So the three norms, think that makes me think of like three Normans. 
So the three norms, they were three female supernatural beings who created and controlled fate. Therefore, they were considered as the most powerful entities in the entire cosmos, more so than even the gods, because the gods were also subject to fate along with the rest of the world's beings. So remember Odin travelling the worlds to escape the fate the Norms said he would fall to in our Odin episode. The Norms are very powerful. They even command the respect and envy of Odin himself. Apart from their loom and tapestry, the three Norms carve runes into the trunk of Yggdrasil. The meanings of these runes run through Yggdrasil and have an effect on all nine of the worlds in the tree's branches. Even the gods have threads of their own in the tapestry, but the three norms will never let them see them. Only they know what fate has in store for all who live in the cosmos. In the old Norse poem, Fafnismal, terrible pronunciations again, there are said to be many norms. Some of them come from the gods, elves and the dwarves. I also read that they were mainly believed to be giantesses of Jotunheim. The first norm is Erd, which means the past and a common word for fate in and of itself. The second, verdandi, means what is presently coming into being. And the third, scold, means what shall be. They are often depicted on a normal human scale and sometimes a norm will have non-human features. For example, verdandi has been depicted with angel wings, although this is not considered to be true to the folklore. Generally, they do not manifest as beautiful. However, many who work with them report them as plain, almost dowdy women who are focused on their work. Some of the norms, such as Skold, have also been shown as Valkyries wearing armour and flying on the backs of war horses. So Valkyries are the female spirits who aid Odin in choosing the bravest of the dead to fight alongside the gods at Ragnarok. The poem Vulispa offers a grander account that is the most commonly referenced today in regards to the norms. In Vulispa, the norms are mysterious beings who come from none of the known, recognised forms of beings of the Norse otherworld. They are a category all of their own. There are just three of them and their names are Erd, meaning the past. Erd is a common word for fate in and of itself. The second word in D means what is presently coming into being and the third is scold, which means what shall be. And I've referenced that twice, but there are so many different ways that their names are explained. The three norms live in a hall by a well called the Well of Fate or Well of Erdebrunner, which is located in Asgard and beneath Yggdrasil, which is, of course, the Tree of Life the mighty tree at the centre of the Norse Otherworld that holds the nine worlds within its branches and roots. There is some disagreement about where exactly they spend their time. Some say they live under Yggdrasil's roots and others say they live over the arch of the Bifrost Bridge. I don't know if it's Bifrost or Bifrost. The Norms have a very important task and that is to help Yggdrasil stay green and healthy. Each morning they carry water from the well and collect the moist earth or clay that lies around the well and pour it over the tree of Yggdrasil. If they should fail to do this daily task, then the ash tree will start to rot. Images where the norms are depicted in Old Norse literature show them weaving cloth, carving likely runes into wood or casting wooden lots, all fate crafting activities. So if we look at these specific tasks, so in caring for Yggdrasil, which is the source of all life, and carving runes into the tree, and engaging in other rituals, most likely associated with the magical practices of the pre-Christian Germanic peoples, the norms built the destinies of all beings, small and large, significant and insignificant. As with any tree, the water would have been absorbed through the roots, pulled up the veins, distributing their decrees throughout the nine realms. 
falling back through the dew produced by the tree's leaves, eventually filtering through the ground and settling back in the well of Erd as knowledge of the past where the process is repeated. The water of Uderbrunner is said to be so pure and strong that anything put into it was bleached white. And all of this links, of course, to birth, life, death, rebirth, the cycle of life. The idea with the norms is that they are a female protective ancestral spirits or desire of any race, tribe, family, and they watch over a woman of their descent who is in labor. They scry the fate of the child being born. This also suggests that each family has norms of their own depending on their descent. Sometimes the norms would appear to look identical. Sometimes they appear with different ages. So unlike the, I think it's pronounced the moray, the Greek fates, Erd is the eldest of the norms and Skold sometimes appears as a maiden. So the word norm has an ambiguous etymology. So some claims have linked it to the Swedish dialect word nerna, meaning to inform secretly. It's also traced to the Indo-European root word ner, which means twist or twine, referring to the norms twisting the threads of fate. In Anglo-Saxon, Erd becomes weird and the norms were referred to as the weird sisters. So weird taking on the meaning of one's ultimate destiny. There is no evidence to show the norms were worshipped as the gods were, but in Old Norse literature and ancient and medieval Germanic literature, you could often see a person lamenting his or her fate. However, in Norse view, fate was blind, it was unable to be changed, you would have to decide the attitude with which you would meet whatever fate happens to bring. It is said that when a new child is born, the norms will appear at its birth to decide how long the newborn should be allowed to live. Whilst observing the child, the norms will measure the child's lifespan, its fate, both good and bad, and weave it into a thread of life. Is it just me or does that make you think of the three fairies on Sleeping Beauty or Maleficent who come and cast their blessings over Aurora and everything always comes in threes? The norms were very respected by the people. It was quite common to serve a special kind of porridge called Norna Gritter, which is Norn Groat Porridge or Norn Porridge to a woman who had just given birth. This ritual was a kind of offering to the norms and the Norse way of showing them the respect they deserved. This ritual was probably done with the intention of bribing or being on the good side of the norms, who in return would bless the mother and the child with good health. The norms were intimately connected to pregnancy, birth and rebirth. In the Norse sagas, it is told that the norms were there before the Aesir came, deciding the fate of all men, weaving the web of weird. If this was the case, it would suggest that they were of the frost giants born in Niflheim, perhaps of the second generation from Ymir, so before the appearance of Buri. It's also speculated that Erd, the eldest norm, is actually the first frost giantess born from Emir. And this means she's the progenitress of the race. New word of the week for me. Progenitress means parent or ancestor. My history teacher in secondary school would literally lose their mind at my D GCSE in history and trying to talk to people about history and research it. But here we are. In Greek mythology, they're collectively known as the Morai, and their names are Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropus. Clotho, whose name means spinner, spins the thread of each person's life. Lachesis, the allotter, measures the thread, and then Atropus, the inevitable, cuts the thread. The Romans called them the Parkai or Phaeta, but similar beings sharp in other cultures as well. For instance, you've got the Russian Rosanaki, the Slovenian Sudzenici, the Bulgarian Nerechnitsi, and the Polish Rodzanis. 
The witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth are also believed to be based on the norms too. The Eddas, Saxo's Chronicles and the Icelandic sagas are the main sources to our understanding of the earlier Nordic beliefs and the old religion. But while they deal with events from the Viking Age, they were written down much later on in the 13th century. So how do we know if these stories and poems are obviously relevant or correct as they were recorded so many years down the line? So if we are going to talk about the three norms, we must talk about the vulva, who are believed to do the same, control people's destiny by spinning thread, yet on a smaller scale. When archaeologists excavated a burial site outside of Harold Bluetooth's Viking fortress called Fear Cat, they uncovered the grave of a vulva. Within her grave, they found a staff and a small box that included henbane seeds, a member of the nightshade family, and of course have effects that include flying sensations, delirium, and sometimes death. They couldn't decipher whether she might have used it for an intoxicating paste or to add flavor to beer, which comes up in ritual. But overall, they realized the vulva was at the center of power, magic, and mystical experiences in the Viking age. Vulvas or witches were honored and revered and sought out as wise women, healers, prophets, shamans, and seers. Sagas show that if a witch came to visit the Lord and Lady, they would give up the high seat to her, which signified the witch had higher authority. The vulva was also allowed to talk or not talk to anyone at her whim, regardless of their status, meaning she was outside and above all normal hierarchy of, her, of society. The name vulva means woman with a staff, and the staff in Norse is also called a gander, which in English is the word wand. This staff was a symbol of power and control of the supernatural, and the word ganda means both wand and magic in Icelandic. Viking tribes often nurtured groups of wise women or witches. Unmarried, they were called valur, which is not valur as in like juicy couture tracksuits, but volur, which is singular vulva and translates as wandwed. All three Norse and Germanic women were expected to be versed in magic, but some more than others. Most of the vulvas would usually live unmarried, though not necessarily celibate. Sounds great, not going to lie. And they could travel alone wherever they liked without fear. A woman who carried the wand of the witch would apparently never be harmed. This was due to them being aligned, of course, with the norms, the fate goddesses, and wielded the greatest of powers. In Viking myth, it is said that the goddess Freya introduced the art of Seda, which is fate magic and shamanism and the art of conquering death to both men and women and in the first instance, even to the gods. So I haven't referred to these women as priestesses because then we in enter into different territory because you had sacrificial priestesses and temple priestesses within the old Norse settings, which is different, completely different. So in the court of Frere, the cult of Frere rather, a high priestess would live as a wife to the god. They wouldn't normally travel, they would be homebound practitioners, again with a high status within the tribe. But at times the witch and the priestess role could overlap within certain tribes and can be more of a grey area. Vulvas would have been buried with their staff as mentioned earlier and this was confirmed in some sagas, but of course, archaeological finds too. Witches and priestess burials from the Germanic Iron Age and Viking Age testify how high a status these women could achieve in life. There were the Osberg ladies who had their burials royally endowed. So these two women were of the year 834 AD in Norway, and they were laid to rest in a ship burial along with 20 horses and several other animals alongside a huge amount of riches. So think of that bin on Vikings that Ragnar cheats on Lagatha with, I can't stand her. And her burial isn't dissimilar, although I only clocked one horse on hers. But these women were also buried with their wands, tapestries, magical amulets and pouches filled with cannabis seeds. So the more I read about vulvas, the more I wish in a past life I was one, because for this next part, 
The vulva had to accept a relatively solitary life. However, this is something that she didn't mind one bit, apparently, because solitude was important for communicating with the gods and people would become a disruption. So she would voluntarily voluntarily create distance. The vulva had direct connection with the divine. So in these times, witchcraft was said to be purely for women within these tribes. This was due to the belief that they hold natural intuition which helped their inherent magic skills so there were male seers and practitioners of seder magic but it was inherently considered a feminine art in those times even odin himself a practitioner of seder magic was ridiculed by loki for being unmanly as a result what a cheek So vulvas were said to be able to make prophecies, read omens, speak with the dead, petition the powers behind weird or fortune, improve an individual's chance of increasing their wealth and their reputation. They will be able to work with the norms and be able to read and even influence the threads woven. The magic of Seder, which means to bind in Old Norse, also allowed the vulva to raise storms, cast love spells and send nightmares to kill someone in their sleep. They were also believed to be able to take animal form, probably using this shamanic power to fight or to travel long distances. In addition, they were said to have healing powers. So when four is injured traveling through Jotunheim, the vulva grower used her witchcraft to heal him. So amongst the Vikings, they would have been considered healing shamans. And I give you, my friend, the hedge witch. Viking vulvas were said to be finely dressed in a blue and red dress with a hot headscarf with golden thread along its edges. And both female and male vulvas would have worn these dresses. Buried vulvas would wear numerous toe rings of silver, which was unusual amongst the Vikings, but it was a sign of wealth and difference within Viking society. So everyone hits Claire's to get their toe rings after listening to this podcast episode. Alongside the staff, she would have been buried with a silver brooch, which would have been plated in gold that contained white lead powder, a toxic substance that may have been used in their rituals. Similar to the vulva I mentioned at the beginning of the vulva section of this episode, whose grave was found, they would have been buried with a small purse of henbane seeds, sometimes bowls and animal bones, which would have been used in her craft. In Norse legend, the vulva that lived in Midgard in Viking age probably learnt their art from the goddess Freya. So Freya was said to be of the Norse gods, the Vanir. Asir gods were powerful in a warlike way, yet Vanir gods had a softer side with esoteric power and were masters of Seder magic. So I recorded the norms part of this episode before the vulva part of this episode and Obviously, I was in the rabbit hole kind of looking at the vulva side of things. And I actually discovered, after saying it, in Sleeping Beauty, the godmothers who bless Aurora are actually based on the free norms. My work here is done. I knew it. Like, that's just so strange that that came up because the vulvas had the ability to bless newborn babies with gifts of character, whereas the norms would sort of figure out what their fate would be and so on. So, yes, the fairy godmothers are based on the vulvas. They also had the power to wield and battle unseen forces for ill or good. So a vulva seance is part of Seder magic, which describes Norse magic. So there is a practice which covers mediumship and prophecy, and I think it's called spa. So spa is most commonly carried out by a vulva. And this is where they enter an altered state of consciousness to speak with spirits. Note also seen on Vikings, carried out by Ragnar's bin of a wife. So they 
sometimes would throw their cloak over themselves to help them focus. This would also link into them metaphorically donning Thraya's cloak to help them travel on a spiritual journey, which could be to other realms of the Norse otherworld. So the vulva for the seance would take a position on a platform or high seat and bang her staff on the floor in a rhythmic manner. So think shamanic drumming. They would also sometimes use a drum instead, either or. The vulva or an assistant, sometimes they even had a group of young girls that would sing a vard liqueur on behalf of the vulva, which is a ritual song used to aid the seance and in the saga of Eric the Red, the songs were often described as lovely and beguiling. Can anyone say the word beguiling without doing it in an Australian accent now? I think Liam Hensworth. In Herolf's saga, the song was described as a terrible sound. So messages would be delivered during the seance to different households that requested the vulva services. Often answers to problems or messages from the deceased even the gods. As the incantation came to an end, the vulva would be caught between two worlds. And at this point in the ritual, she could predict the future and provide prophecies. So the Vard Locker, so the song used in the seance, would be used to raise the energy, to help the vulva enter her trance, to channel energy, to attract and keep the spirits bound to the ritual area until their message had been given. The song would also protect the vulva from bad spirits or bad energies. Some would also take protections before the seance. They might ask the deceer, so they would ask an ancestor or God to protect them. So the word vardloka broken down means guardian or watcher. So the word ward comes from it too. And of course, we use wards to protect ourselves against bad spirits evil, negative energies. I mean, come on, how much of this has seeped into our modern day practices? The vulva would often have an assistant, as said before, who might have sung the Vardloka, but they would also act as their ward, ensuring they were guarded or watched over whilst in their trance state. And locker means to lure or attract, so this would apply to the spirits. The Vardloka would differ in tone depending on what it was being used for. So for more gentle rituals such as healing or welcoming of spirits to welcome a baby, they would have used songs more akin to a lullaby. But for more aggressive spirit needs, it would have been quite gruff combined with the banging of the staff or a drum and perhaps like rattles. I mean, how similar is that to shamanic music that we know now? So I went further down the rabbit hole and I discovered that one of my favourite artists, I'm probably going to pronounce this incorrectly, Eva, E-I-V-O-R, she's actually an artist of a similar nature to the types of singing they might have used. So enchanting vocals, breathing techniques, drums and so on. If you listen to one song of hers, wow, listen to Trollabundin, the lyrics are literally magic, they are, the lyrics in English, like translated are spellbound, I am, I am, the wizard has enchanted me, enchanted me, spellbound, deep in my soul, in my soul, in my heart burns a sizzling fire, a sizzling fire, Spellbound, I am, I am. The wizard has enchanted me, enchanted me. Spellbound in my heart's root, my heart's root. My eyes gaze to where the wizard stood. Beautiful. Like the song itself is just unreal. So you may have heard her music. If you've watched Last Kingdom, a British program about the Vikings, she produced the soundtrack for that. And wow, it's truly magical. So at the end of the Viking Age, the rise of Christianity saw the vulva persecuted as a dangerous magic practitioner and staff bearer of the old religion. Staffs became strictly outlawed. So under the Vikings, which is what honoured and respected, and under Christianity, they were persecuted. Well, I think that's 
I'm not so cocky now. <laughs> I think that's all I have in me today, which is I'm really tired, but that's my offering for Norse magic. My head hurts, but I've loved this topic. Going into the rabbit hole on this was unreal. I loved it. Like there was so much that I found that, yeah, I think I've delivered all that I think I can. I just want to say if you feel the call to and are happy to give me an Apple review for the podcast, I would be eternally grateful. Thank you so much for all your messages. Like I love hearing from you guys. Like it's such honestly, like you are all I've everyone I speak to just seems like such lovely people. Honestly, like genuinely think like the witchcraft witchcraft community is a lovely space or just all the ones I seem to speak to anyway. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aside from that, you can find me over on Instagram at The White Witch Company, Facebook, The White Witch Company. I'll put all the links in the show notes. I'm actually going to see if I can put that song Trella Bundin in as well. I love it. I listen to it all the time when I'm writing and researching. So have a listen. You can email me, Carly, at The White Witch Company. I have a little surprise for you soon, my fabulous witches, which will all be apparent soon. Lots of witchy love. Catch up with you all very soon. Mm-hmm.